back again. Right now, we're going to have a session from Gus Andrews. You can find her at keepcomlogon.com with her new book. She's also the special project lead for Theorem Media working on the cyber security project. And uh, we'll go ahead and write to the video. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Gus Andrews, and this is my talk, Anatomy of an Accidental Honeypot, aka uh, First Initial Last Name at Gmail Considered Harmful, or How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love that Every Other G. Andrews in the World Uses My Email Address. This is my bio. I'm just putting it on screen for the sake of hope. Um, I don't expect you to read this, but you can pause at this frame if you'd like to. TLDR, I've done digital security training, among other things. I signed up for Gmail on June 16th of 2004 and was lucky enough to snag my first initial and last name um, at some point. And uh, a few years later, I stopped using the address largely because the sheer amount of misaddressed email I was getting there um, was just becoming overwhelming. Uh, but on the first day I was using Gmail, I got an email, as every Gmail user at the time did, saying, Gmail is different. Here's what you need to know. First off, welcome, and thanks for agreeing to help us test Gmail. Wow, that was a million years ago. Um, you'll find information there on such topics as how to use address autocomplete. And so I'm at this point going, was they, were they actually among the first to use address autocomplete? Um, that they had to explain that. So those of us who picked up a first initial last name account um, or other account that resembled our name thought we were really super clever, but as Randall Monroe of XKCD has pointed out, um, that once you have a first initial last name account, you end up getting email from a lot of people. And I don't think it's actually just older people. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the younger people as well um, who have been sending stuff. Um, G Andrews at Gmail, um, which is the account I'll be talking about today, is kind of like being Senator G Andrews, public figure G Andrews, lives in the center of town G Andrews, everybody knows where you are. Everybody turns their attention that way and ultimately it ends up being pretty problematic. Conservatively, um, with deduplication by name and address, there are at least 200 individual people worldwide over 17 years, 17 years I've had this address, uh, for whom email appears to show up in this account. Uh, and these include professors whose students send their assignments and then wonder whether those assignments got through. And a medical note for a man in South Africa excusing him from work after cardiac surgery. Uh, an engineer at Apple who charmingly spelled the town his campus is in as Coop Ternino uh, and ordered a sophisticated audio analysis device and sent the receipt and FedEx to this account so I could have just diverted that sophisticated audio device to me if I'd wanted to. I fortunately wasn't even looking at the account at the time. Um, the mail includes a social mailing list from the military installation at Fort Gordon, which happens to be a signals intelligence unit. And so if you happen to know anybody who works in signals intelligence there, you might want to let them know they're leaking a lot of signals. Um, worse yet, there's also physical plant service uh, requests from another military academy. So if I wanted to go mess with the HVAC system, that might be how I'd do it. Uh, one of my favorites is a grandpa saying to his grandson, go buy that house and signing off Paw Paw. And what he has sent along is a letter, it's a PDF with his bank name, his bank routing number, the account number for that uh, bank account, and his signature and telling them, please give my grandson $11,000, which I could easily just yoink and take there if I wanted to. But I'm an ethical hacker and um, I'm not going to do that. This is a map of all of the known places where I've definitely identified people um, who are uh, sending email to this account. The spread appears to be based, as far as I can tell, on population density. No matter where you're from, uh, if there's a George or a Gary Andrews in your area, and for some reason they are disproportionately represented in this data set, um, maybe they even sent email to this account themselves, because sometimes they CC themselves. Um, you look at the email for long enough, you look at this account for long enough, and full life stories begin to grow out of them. So for example, there's a 20-something in New Mexico who works on call as a sign spinner. His boss yells at him to work through rain and wind if possible, but says if there is lightning or the rain or wind is too heavy, go to your car and wait and don't spin your sign. Um, the footer of her email cryptically warns, quote, you have the right to remain silent about your brand, ostensibly the brand that he's advertising at the time. You have the right to do nothing. If you choose, an agency can represent you. If you cannot afford an agency, you can probably call us anyway and try to work a deal. Who knows, it might not even be such a waste of time. Do you understand these rights? 
I don't think that legal, that legal footers actually work the way that she thinks they do, but I'm not sure what that ominous thing means. Outside of work, this young man spends his time at the Ultimate Ninja Obstacle Gym. Uh, one time he tried a free yoga class, and forever after he got invited back to that studio to be the light. CVS thinks he might be paying too much for his EpiPen. Uh, he was interested in buying a Camaro, but the agent who was at the car dealership never managed to reach him because he gave her an email address that wasn't really his. It was mine. There is a group of Stanford University frat brothers who recently celebrated the year their 50th anniversary of graduation, so congratulations. Uh, these are men with names like Tweez and Boog, uh, who are professors and doctors and lawyers now. And they, and they have hobbies like wine terroir uh, and paleontology, uh, and apparently also guessing what someone's email address ought to be. There is also a family in North Carolina who regularly go to Africa to provide optometry services to people there. The mother, Patsy, developed cancer. Bravely, she said she wasn't afraid to die. Uh, she'd already faced the worst in losing her son to a car crash some 30 years earlier. Her husband said, quote, she is still in charge and I am good at taking orders. Uh, she attended her cancer center's Halloween party dressed as the Queen Bee, so we get the sense she was a very strong personality. When I was getting their email, I had recently lost my father and grandmother to cancer, and I kept pleading with the family to stop CCing me on their cancer updates so I could just get some relief from thinking about it for a while. When my pleas were to no avail, uh, as any good hacker would, I figured out who they were and where they lived, and I sent them a Christmas card. And that was how I ended up mentioned in a newspaper in a North Carolina town I had never been to. And that newspaper reported, Last Wednesday, Patsy received a handwritten note from Gus Andrews, not the former county commissioner, but a Gus Andrews who lives in New York City. Somehow, he'd mistakenly gotten on the email update list, but he felt compelled, like so many others, to follow Patsy's story. Uh, that he is me, by the way, in case you hadn't figured that out. They hadn't figured that out either. Um, the passive voice used there saying somehow he'd mistakenly gotten on the email update list, meaning me, implies that I had somehow accomplished this myself, but that wasn't actually what happened. The father of the family had CC'd me. And this is how Patsy, who was a Latin teacher, bridge player, and swim coach, and who unfortunately passed away February of last year, came to be memorialized at a hacker conference. Rest in peace. Why did these people CC me? Why was I getting email from sign twirlers, ninja gyms, yoga studios, frat brothers, car dealerships, and drugstores in New Mexico? These are the voyages of my first initial last name email address on a mass public email service. My continuing mission, to explore the worlds of people who send email to the wrong address from Vanuatu to Vancouver, St. Paul to South Africa, to seek out new ways they may have compromised their security by using this address, to boldly determine what in the ever-loving William Shatner is going on with the over 200 people in this inbox. Frankly, mass public email domains like Gmail and Outlook were not what the founders and developers of email uh, envisioned. Email kind of bubbled up organically in the 1960s with a handful of protocols and systems, and the first ARPANET email was sent in 1971. Back then, military and universities were pretty much the people who had email, and that was about it. And users numbered in the hundreds tops. That was how many people were using email worldwide. And so if you wanted to reach somebody at that point in time, it was not unreasonable to guess the address they might have at their university or office because there were only a few people. It was less likely you'd make a mistake. Anything you did wrong would just disappear into the ether. Um, but uh, nowadays that strategy is less of a good one, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so email infrastructure is about 50 years old, um, but because it's so flexible and open, uh, it means we're not likely to see people abandon it anytime soon, and this is uh, somewhat problematic in a lot of ways. Uh, for those of us who use encryption, we know that it's not built into the original protocols, um, so it's actually bolted on in a lot of ways. Um, there have also been some problems about email that have been that are challenging in situations like this, and always have been challenging in situations like this. So, for example, it's not possible to unsend an email uh, if you made a mistake, um, which is a huge problem for the folks in this data set. It's not possible to interrupt someone either, like it might be on certain kinds of chat where you see the little three dots saying, this person is about to speak now, and go, no, no, wait, 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 uh, that's not me, I made a mistake, you made a mistake, you wanna address somebody else. Um, you can do that if you're speaking with somebody in person or over the phone, um, we might be used to that, but um, on email, unfortunately, that affordance is not available to us. So compared to that original couple hundred email users, today it is estimated there are 3.9 billion active email users. 
And it's not just that there are 3.9 billion users, over a third of users now have more than one email address. And that begins to make for some significant complications, right? So let's think for a second about what's changed since 1971. There are many, many more top level domains. Um, that's things like .com, .org, um, you know, .edu. Um, the, you know, we now have, unfortunately, uh, .nyc. Um, there are many more people who are able to get domains easily. Uh, there are many more domains, um, and when I say domains, I mean the ones that are to the left of the top level domain, the before the final dot. Um, there are people who will squat those, they'll typo squat them. So for example, somebody, unless Google has bought it up, somebody has certainly bought up G-O-O-G -O -O number one, which looks like an L-E. Um, and they'll sit there and wait there for anything sent there to see if they can just scoop up any stuff that might be valuable that comes in that way. Um, so those permutations are really, really valuable. Um, there are many, many more non-academic domains, um, and we have a rise of cheap disposable email accounts. So Gmail, for example, um, Outlook, Live, uh, Yahoo. Um, there's much more use of commercial email for marketing. And so the combinatorics of this get absolutely bananas, um, right? You know, you end up with uh, so many ways that things can go wrong. I don't know why ICANN made it so much worse for us by adding more. I'm not sure that anybody asked for more top-level domains. It just made things more complicated. Uh, there's no accounting for what people ultimately do with their email address. Um, it, it's worth noting that uh, the um, ultimate rule sets, um, the RFCs that specify uh, what can happen with email, RFC 822 specifies that domain names are case insensitive, right? So um, to the right-hand side of the at, um, you can do uppercase, lowercase, it'll all go to the same place, but to the left, um, in the username part, anything goes. So somebody could conceivably say, you know, all caps email um, is uh, different. If, you're, if your name's in all caps, then it's a different name than if your name's in, all, in lowercase. Um, and so I'm gonna talk in a second about what uh, is particularly complicated about that. One of the challenges is that when software developers are building sign-in systems for accounts, a lot of them treat an email address as if it uniquely identif identifies a person, that it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You have one person, one email address. Sometimes they do, sometimes if you're serving marketing email, they don't, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, I'm finding a number of uh, companies who don't seem to care that they're sending different marketing emails um, and different receipts even for actual services um, to the same account, uh, even though it's uh, clearly identified with a different person. There's also a matter of shared accounts. There are plenty of people who may share accounts for work. They may share accounts with people in their family. Um, but leaving aside shared accounts, um, the assumptions that developers make are problematic in a, in a number of ways. Um, one of them is that uh, when you use email as a login, you're basically giving, you're using the means of contacting somebody also as the means of identifying them. So if somebody needs to identify themselves, they have to give something where somebody could then spam them or write to them or you know, possibly even stalk them. Um, as you know, I've heard a lot of people um, worrying about WhatsApp, for example, using your phone number. Um, similarly to email, um, in order to uh, identify people, because then um, if that gets spread around, people can harass you in other ways. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, if you use it in one account, it's this is also a way that you could use this information to get to other accounts used by the same person, because it's the same identifier across things. Actually, this is something that was developed over time, which is actually seen as more useful and more user-friendly, because if you have to memorize both the username and your email address, um, and you don't remember which one is the way of identifying you, it's easier just to use email address because you know people will forget, because they also have to memorize a password. They have to remember a password, they have to remember their username, um, and so it's easier just to go, well, you remember what your email address is, let's just use that, is, um, using this uh, as your identification instead. Um, given that using email address uh, to serve as a username is an industry-wide standard practice, uh, there aren't that many great and usable alternatives, and a solution to that problem is sort of outside of the scope of this talk, but it's worth noting that that is a concern. Um, but uh, as I'm about to show you, some of the practices from different companies actually um, make this really problematic. Gmail, as you may know, uh, ignores dots in the username part of the address. So if I make an address that's g.andrews, it also, it goes to gandrews and uh, it continues to just um, be sent there. There's also a number of other things like plus and things like that. A number of people in the audience may be using these uh, to send their spam to a different inbox or something like that. Um, however, 
devs at companies that are not Google or Gmail do not make the distinction that uh, G Andrews and G dot Andrews are actually the same address. So they may make separate accounts um, that look unique uh, for each of those addresses. And that ends up being problematic. In the process of sorting out what was in this inbox, uh, I discovered that you can look up Apple IDs using only first name, last name, and email address. And it will confirm to you that this person is associated with this account because uh, as, as it happened, there were multiple G Andrews's who were sending information to uh, G Andrews at Gmail. So um, the, like I said, this is, kind of a security flaw in what Apple is doing. Basically, they will just, if you say, I've forgotten my username, I've forgotten my email address, um, tell me which address this might be associated with. It just gives you this field, that, these fields that say first name, last name, and email address. If you enter them in, it will say to you, yes, in fact, there is a Gabriella C, I've obscured the more identifying part of her last name, um, at g.andrews at gmail.com. And yes, um, so now if somebody knows those pieces of information, they have an active email address that they can then, um, you know, target in some way, uh, which could be super problematic. Um, and here was the other one that showed up in this account. I'm including George Andrews's full name because like I said, there were so many G George Andrews's who happened to have sent email to this account that it's not distinguishing which one of them it is. It's one of the George Andrews's, and we know it associates to me. One of the things I want to note is that neither of these addresses were ever confirmed by my account. I never went and um, completed the round trip back to the website saying, uh, when they initially said a thing saying, an Apple ID was set up to this account, please confirm. I never confirmed. And yet these have continued to be serving as uh, Apple ID accounts for these people for a number of years after this. Um, so George is ostensibly out there still using this account, and um, Apple will confirm that to you. Um, George has unsuccessfully tried to reset this account multiple times since he signed up in 2011, and the other account was set up in 2012. Um, I'm not certain whether Apple has since insisted on that round trip um, that somebody come back and confirm, yes, there is a human being here, and yes, this is the Apple ID associated with it. Um, so this might not be... If, if they've done it, they ha it's not retroactive to these accounts. Like these ones are still associated, despite the fact that nobody ever confirmed that these were in fact, um, you know, the ones, th there was actually a, the correct human being here. Um, so I still need to file a bug report on this. If there's anybody from Apple listening, this is, um, you know, kind of a problem. I'm not exactly sure how to solve it. The other thing I determined as I was going through these accounts um, was that you can also add the same email address as a rescue address um, or a uh, you know an alternate address um, for an account that you already have an apple id you already have with another address um, these ones do require a round trip they do require you to go in and confirm because i've had a couple of them happen and then when you go um, or at the very least when you go back to one of these where you go back to this form and enter the name and the email address um, it doesn't then confirm that that same email address is uh, associated as a rescue ID with something else. So at the very least, it's not revealing that information there. Um, and, but uh, Apple will also send uh, a code to that address saying, please confirm that you want this to be the rescue address. I'm assuming that thereafter, if that code is not returned, then um, it's not associated with that account. So um, ultimately, it looked like there were going to be about a half a dozen uh, Apple ID accounts that were associated with this address. Um, in the end, I think ultimately there, there are officially only those two that I showed you a second ago. Um, so I can see adding that additional email address as a rescue address as a feature, not a bug. So consider the one kid, four grandparents scenario. So uh, I, you know, say I have four grandparents, none of them feel like they're particularly strong at technology. And so they say, I want you to set this up and you can have my rescue address. And anytime I need to go in and reset a password, I'm set up to do that with this rescue address. So maybe it's a feature. Um, use cases are use cases. Um, they're always diverse and strange. Um, but I just still don't know if it's really desirable to have um, rescue addresses work in this way. Um, the other thing that will be sent to an account uh, if you use this address is service tickets. Uh, so no poor kid who uh, wrote in saying, hi, uh, my dad's email address is uh, gandrews at gmail. I can't buy a thing with his account. I'm locked out. Could you please? No, kid, we're not going to do that for you. Sorry, you do not get that service. That, that service uh, uh, request is not happening for you. I just want to note that the email I'm getting at the G Andrews at Gmail account is not all spam. It's not all malicious. There is spam. Certainly the spam folder is full of hundreds of, of emails on a given point in time. 
um, but I'm not including that email in my analysis of this. I'm trying to winnow out um, the spam as much as I possibly can. Um, there's a lot of commercial mail coming in, but it tends to be from, it tends to have started someplace. So it usually started with somebody buying something from someplace and thereafter constantly getting mail from say Old Navy, right? So it was spam, but it starts with a receipt. And I'll talk about those receipts in a second and what you can get out of those receipts. If you wanna talk about spam, I highly recommend Finn Brunton's book on spam, a really excellent book, but I'm not gonna talk about spam beyond this slide. Um, you might also want to be talking about phishing here. You might think that, oh, you know, the mails that you're getting are somebody trying to fish you, but that would be a mistake. Um, phishing obviously is trying to get documents out of you, um, getting you to send along things. This is sending documents to me and it's sending documents to me that should not be sent to me at all. Um, so I may have swept up a couple of pieces of phishing email um, in here, but for the most part, I'm pretty good at identifying them. I don't think that's mostly what's going on here. Um, this is also not exactly shaped like the usual data breach where somebody goes and attacks a company. Um, it is a data breach, but it's performed by the users themselves in a matter of multiple errors. So that's sort of a strange thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the shape of this is. Methods, you may be wondering, how did I take a look at this stuff? How did I slice and dice it? Uh, I used a couple of um, things that worked with um, the Google uh, email access to these, this Gmail account, uh, maelstrom and unroll.me. Um, yeah, there's some sort of questionable practices there that they may have about selling data on, but I'm just using this as a rough data set. It's a very messy data set. I don't think it's really of much use to them. Maelstrom is an interesting tool. Um, it is basically meant for people to give them all their Gmail and then it will batch it out by who has sent things to you, uh, topics and things like that. And it helps you delete things really quickly. So that did a really good job of helping me see really quickly um, who I was getting mail from and possibly if there was any uh, relation uh, I did a lot of search queries to look through with this, so um, frequently if, to look at that commercial email, I would sort of frob it by the date, just turning the knob back and forth. So I would go, okay, Old Navy, what was the earliest Old Navy uh, mail I got? And, you know, sort of saying uh, before date something, 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 do I still have mail? Okay, yes, I do. Um, and here's the initial receipt that this mail came from. So that was really useful to look at here if anybody else also wants to look at a data set like this. Um, and uh, then the to field was also really useful in a lot of ways. Um, this is one of the ways that I knew I was actually getting mail from a whole bunch of different people because sometimes somebody would write in um, gandrews at gmail.com and they'd give it a name like this is Gloria or this is Gwen. And so that was how I knew this, these were people trying to reach different people. How do we know that there are all these different people? Um, and how do we know they're individuals? Um, like I just said, the to field. Um, so uh, another question is, do people use this email address more than once? Um, and yeah, they do. Like I was just looking today and found somebody over the course of a number of years um, writing to this. Um, geography can be consistent. So I've actually gone back and looked by zip code a lot of the time and you will find that the same zip code comes up multiple times. Like the guy in New Mexico who's a sign twirler. That's how I figured out it was him at the car dealership. Um, at the yoga studio and at his car, his sign twirling thing, and also at CVS. Um, if they used this to sign up for something, if they purchased something, this is pretty clearly coming from a person, right? Like, I think we can pretty much agree that it's not likely that the company is just going to generate that email address out of nowhere. Um, another way that people have called themselves out here is they CC themselves. So it's somebody with an address that is very clearly also a permutation of G. Andrews who's mailing to G. Andrews at Gmail and forwarding something that has been sent to somewhere else. Um, so that's another way, and that will happen multiple times over the course of a number of years. Sometimes somebody else sends something to them, um, and in one or two cases, I have actually contacted these people personally. Um, there was the case in which I wrote to the people and sent them a Christmas card and did have a, a charming back and forth with Patsy uh, before we lost her. Um, and with the newspaper down there. And then um, another time a woman signed me up for an account at target.com uh, where I determined that I could in fact log into that account and order things using her credit card and have them sent to myself. And so I looked her up by address, found her address in the corpus, figured out who she was online, called her on the phone and said, you need to change this now. Um, I have changed this password. I have set it to random. I don't know what it is anymore. Please, you know, send this back. And what she said back to me was, oh, I forget sometimes. My address is actually G. Andrews. And she had just left the off. 
So that is one of the mistakes that people are making. What can we learn about someone if we have a data set like this? Oh, it's pretty much everything that you can get off of social media and then some, and it's worse. Um, the most interesting ways to search, like I said, zip code is a great one. Uh, go search for passwords. You will find some that are sent in the clear. Go search for social security number. This is getting really depressing. You can search for W2s. Um, actually, the most entertaining search uh, was Adobe. One of the most fruitful things was just to search the corpus for Adobe, because usually there's an attachment and it's usually some sort of PDF. And that means it's something that's probably pretty important. So we got DMV records um, with name, address, make, model of car, license plate number, all of those things. Um, birthday shows up. Uh, FedEx and UPS records are also really fun. You definitely get an address out of those a couple of times, and you can see people over the years um, sending things to themselves, but CCing the same email address for whatever reason. Um, that included the guy at Apple in Coop Tornino. Um, Let's see, uh, job search sites are really interesting. There's a lot of people searching, uh, using this address to uh, say, you know, send me jobs in my area. Uh, found a lot of interesting things there. It tells you a little bit about the fields they're working in. Credit card bills, obviously, those show up as well. Um, people forward them to themselves. Uh, do a search for each major online service. Evite's a good one. You can figure out who's going to like, if one of them was to a 10th grade, or sorry, a 10 year old's birthday party. Uh, I don't want to know who went to that. Uh, Amazon, dating sites, things like that. Um, insurance, a lot of insurance paperwork showed up. Um, receipts can be super problematic. Square, for example, I think for a while was actually sending people's signature on the receipt. And uh, that is mega problematic because that gives me another way that I can prove I am this person who has control of this email address that looks plausible and all this other information about this person. Phone companies, some of the times would send along a SIM ID, great for anybody who wants to SIM swap. Um, my other latest favorite way to search this inbox is to search for .za, which is for South Africa, um, because in the particular case of South Africa, it turns out there's only maybe three G. Andrews's, whereas in the United States, there are hundreds. Um, so I actually really got a clear picture of who was who, um, whose kid was being sent to which school, who was a professor at which school, who was working in mining, who was working in different fields. Uh, and when I say exciting, I mean this is super depressing because it's really depressing to think about all these people missing their mail. So Domino's Pizza, one of the major offenders in this field, um, will send to the same address things for people at any address anywhere in the country. They do not seem to care. It will clearly be a different G. Andrews every time. It was definitely George, it was definitely Gary, it was a bunch of guys uh, and women as well. And um, it will, they will usually send along your delivery address and your callback number as well. So if somebody should happen to get control of this and they're stalking you, game over. Uh, also, if you're an insurance company, you can see who's really heavy on the nitrate-laden meats and maybe people are headed for some sort of, I don't know, medical problem as a result. Um, so it was useful frequently to go look for the zip code in that uh, particular receipt and then build out a profile of the person um, based, of, uh, based on uh, that particular zip code. Why are people doing this? As I have said in many, many Hope Talks before, it is never just because they are stupid. That is not the way to understand what is going on. If you begin to say people are stupid, you close down your understanding and the, their understanding of what the problem is, and we're never going to fix it. Ultimately, I don't think these people are entirely in the wrong. It is useful to have an address to give people when you know somebody wants to send you a lot of commercial spam and you don't want it. Um, but the strategy I see people using uh, where they're using this account is not really helpful because they are using a real address to which they don't have access. So if ongoing email comes to that address, they don't have access to it anymore. Um, and like I said about receipts, that really begins to uh, compromise their own security. So how would we talk to people um, about the safe way to handle unwanted email of different kinds, right? Let's talk for a second about the mistakes people make that seem to lead them here. Outright guessing. Um, this was a really fun one. I got mail for, for a greg.andrews at one point, and I know it was to greg.andrews because the person sending it, I think it was another real estate deal, was like, hi, you contacted our website and I'm guessing this is you. And they CC'd Greg.Andrews on it. And then Greg.Andrews wrote back saying, no, no, I get this all the time. This was very definitely for somebody else sent back. And then the person from that real estate company took that thread and they forwarded it to me. So this is just like throwing darts at a board. Whoever we think might have this address, and I've, I've heard this from other friends as I've, I've started talking about this to other people, um, 
I've, I've heard them say, yeah, you know, I, I had this guess at my name as well. Um, and like I said, that used to be useful maybe, or it could be useful still if you are looking at a small office. But when you're talking about Gmail, you're talking about everybody in the world, and you really shouldn't be guessing at that point in time. Um, the other thing you would see is um, sometimes even on the same email, you would just be, it would be different permutations of G. Andrews and just a, like a long CC string. They would all come to me, they'd go to the other G. Andrews's as well. Forwarding to themselves, people were CCing themselves, and they were sending themselves delightful things like a badass picture of a celestial dragon, and a whole bunch of pictures of sloths, and for some reason a gerbil along with the sloths. I really don't know. It's like, it's like five, five sloths. There was another sloth I couldn't include. It was sloth. It was too long. I don't even know why the layout was like this. And then there was a gerbil. Um, it was for 30 soup recipes. She forwarded herself 30 soup. Thanks for the soup recipes. I'm not going to look at them. Um, the pictures of the family reunion. That was great and charming, but really also depressing because now I know your whole family. Um, and it was even more depressing uh, when this one person was also... Uh, sending themselves their bills from another account, right? Because then I was beginning to get a picture of, yeah, these are all the bills from the same person. Addresses were there, all of this other identifying information. Ah, stick to the sloths. It's better when you stick to the sloths. People will typo their own names. Sometimes they'll typo their own names in creating the email account. So it might be G. Andrew, G. Andrews, but no E, because they couldn't get G. Andrews. Um, and then they just continuously send it to this account anyway. Sometimes somebody is... Um, talking to somebody on the phone and giving them their email address. This was sent to somebody who was supposed to be G. Andrew Hess, G. Andrew. Hess, and it was transcribed as G. Andrew. S. And so, of course, it came to me. Uh, oh, right, it wasn't at Gmail is another way of forgetting this, right? So there is one G. Andrews who I have once again gotten in touch with. Um, and I was like, hey, this keeps happening on a bunch of different stuff, hotel receipts, uh, square receipts. And she was like, oh, right, I don't control it at Gmail, uh, Gmail, I have it at Outlook or something like that. And so a constant misremembering of which domain you have which address at. Um, so that's one of the problems of one person having multiple domains is you may forget. Autocomplete, I'm not totally sure. Um, it seems plausible that there might be some system out there that would uh, autocomplete to f you type in something that it's like, and Gmail. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case. Uh, devs, if you have done that, don't do that. It's not helping. Not even the right name. There are some really ex inexplicable ones. Something to Geraldine Williams, something to Caroline, Carolyn Bernstein, or Dennis. Hi, Dennis. I don't know why you have a G. Andrews. Well, you could ask, like, G. Andrews, is that really you? D and G are not that close on the keyboard. I don't know. One of the allegations that might get made, as it was made about my dissertation data as well, is maybe these people just don't know how email works. Maybe they don't know how addresses work. Um, I see some indication that this might be the case. And one of the reasons why is there's an absolute ton of things here from uh, various job search websites. It's possible, I think, that people are, are signing up f to go apply for jobs and possibly the job recruiters, the people at the workforce development sites, um, at the unemployment office, are saying, plausibly, this is your email address. I really hope that's not the case, um, but you know, I mean, that, that could be there are people who are maybe re-entering the workforce and they really don't know that it's not their email address. You get a lot of things from uh, job listing sites that end up looking creepily similar. So one of these is from Job Serious, another is from UK, UK Staff. A lot of them look like kind of fly-by-night job websites. Um, some of them don't exist anymore. Some of them have been bought by other websites. Um, these might just actually be uh, ad click generation sites in some way. Um, so that was sort of a, I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on here. It might be worth somebody else looking into it at some point. Um, but uh, it does point up this problem of, um, you know, people who don't really know how email works, possibly getting caught in a web of, of creepy spam um, and, uh, you know, their information going to places that it really shouldn't. So which industries seem to have the biggest problems with this? Uh, there are some industries that are overrepresented in the corpus of this data, data sets. Uh, one of them is real estate, a lot of real estate. Real estate and automotive, um, I think, are just looking at lead generation. So if they get some email address, they're just gonna keep writing and keep writing and keep writing and really hope that somebody buys that Camaro or whatever. Um, and real estate's the same way. I got a lot of offers like, here's some property in the UK you might be interested in, thanks. I don't know. Uh, construction, unfortunately, there's also a lot of construction sites um, that uh, seem to be sending email around this way. Uh, retail really, like I said, does not care a lot of the time how many times it sends to one email account with different names, different addresses. 
I'm assuming they just like to say, you know, we have this many customers and that looks good for somebody's uh, metrics somewhere. Uh, but Domino's and CVS are really bad about leaking information in terms of like what your local story is and stuff like that. Uh, it's really pretty creepy. I have to think that ultimately this has got to ruin your data set because if you don't actually have a live person when you're trying to sell them something, why would you keep? The, why would you want to keep that address? I would begin to prune these things. One or two of the companies uh, I did see um, saying, hey, if you're not responding, we're assuming you're not there and taking you off our list. And I'm like, please take them off the list. So what is this? It's not exactly a data breach. I think it's a honeypot, right? So if somebody hacked an account, the first initial last name account, it would be incredibly valuable. Um, there'd be all sorts of stuff for people all over the world. Uh, it's a disturbing amount of valuable information in there. Um, so the question then is how likely is this to be used by malicious actors? Who would even be interested in something like this? As it happens, there's a website called OG Users, which we heard about recently in the recent Twitter hack. If you don't know about this offshoot of black market web services, I recommend getting familiar with it. Um, this podcast, uh, The Snapchat Thief on Reply All was a really, really interesting look into this, um, into this particular culture. So let's take a look at OG users. What exactly is OG users, their original gangsta? Let's take a tour around their website, shall we? What even is this place about? It's about leading discussion in marketplace. And the king is strapped to a rocket, rock, strapped to a rocket for some reason. I don't know. He's got a thumbs up. If you if you dig super super deep, then you actually find something that says that it's a community driven digital marketplace that connects buyers and sellers from all around. Of what though? Oh, of virtual products. Can I get my second live avatar there? I don't know. You can also participate in general discussions on our site. Make new friends and have some fun. Can't even tell what's going on. The website just looks as if it answers the question, what would a bootstrap template look like if it was bitten by a zombie who was hungry for Yeezys? There's not much information on what's actually happening here. They have a hundred plus topics and members and accounts, but what is it for? But then you dig in deeper. Maybe it is about Yeezys. Maybe it's about fashion. Uh, it's about sneaker pimping because there actually is a clothing and fashion board. So if you listen to the, the Reply All podcast, which I highly recommend, it's a very entertaining tale. Um, the idea behind OG users that there, there are people out there, and they're pretty young for the most part, who are really interested in having, um, you know, it was like the, if anybody here remembers the ICQ username wars of whenever a trillion years ago, having a low number of digits was, you know, it was making you OG. It made you like, uh, you were one of the original people on the website. You were maybe ostensibly some kind of influencer. Yeah, I don't really know. Um, you know, so, but, but having a, a low level um, account of some sort is considered to be desirable in the same way that like a Yeezy sneaker or a Gucci handbag or what have you is, right? So this is a status symbol, basically. Their status markers are for early adoption. Um, and so that was what we saw in the Twitter hack is that some of the people who were involved in hacking Twitter recently were going for usernames like six or L, right? Because those were ones that ostensibly a lot of people would look for whether intentionally or not. So now I'm not saying that gandrews at gmail.com is somehow sexy, it is not. Uh, as you can see, pretty much all that email would fall under, uh, in this sense, other OG accounts, which is presumably where you keep the olds, uh, like myself. I am now an old, uh, because I am not interested in Instagram, gamer tags, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, or Steam, or various other gaming sites. Most OG users are, are really concerned that apparently with gaming accounts and also very recent social media. Um, but ostensibly, you can get email accounts on here as well. One way or another, the infrastructure is here to buy and sell um, any username. And uh, if you listen to the Reply All, Reply All podcast, what you learn is that in fact, this is not just we happen to have access to these accounts. There are people actively swim, sim swapping, attacking and stealing these accounts from people. So I would assume that there are uh, other very simple, basic uh, Gmail usernames that are being bought and sold on some marketplace some, somewhere. Um, so uh, you'll notice also here that uh, they're selling high stat accounts. So they're selling accounts that presumably have a number of usernames. I didn't sign up because I don't want to sign up for an account here. Um, but I'm assuming that if I dug into those Instagram and Twitters, I would find something where I could be an instant influencer by having accounts with tens of thousands of followers there. Digging further into OG users, um, I begin to get a sense from this part that says member services here, where it says middleman services and social media services that this is along the lines of the phishing as a service providers that were described in Ashley Bang and Zach Allen's 
battling super mutants in the fishing wasteland talk at ShmooCon earlier this year. So they were seeing what they were calling a platform capitalism shift in cybercrime, where now if you're going to fish people, if you're going to execute a DDoS attack and take down a website by uh, swamping it with traffic, uh, or if you want to source uh, leaked credit cards or password links, that now comes with a dashboard. There is somebody who's created the software to sell you um, the entire service and there's concierge service. So if you have problems with your DDoS attack and it's not going the way you want, there's a concierge there to say, how may I help you in continuing to do your evil deeds in taking down a website? Uh, it's not pretty, right? So that this is a major shift and I'm assuming this is part of that infrastructure. I could be wrong. Like I said, I'm not going any deeper into OG uh, users. Um, so if you listen to the podcast uh, on Reply All, you mostly hear about the kids involved because it's like designer clothes, but this overlaps clearly with larger scale, scale criminal networks. Um, and in those hands, a first name, first initial last name or first name last name account could be used to extract a lot more value. What to do? Uh, there's so many things that are problematic. Um, Companies could actually make sure they complete, this is probably the biggest takeaway, companies could actually complete round trip verification. If you are going to send somebody a challenge saying, verify that you actually are the user with this account, um, make sure it comes back to you and make that account go away if it doesn't. There are people apparently not doing that. Uh, Apple, I would hope, would do something about the legacy accounts that didn't complete that round trip. They should be verified and checked if at all possible, if that's possible at this point in time. Uh, security trainers, if you train people in security, um, if you find people need a disposable email account, guide them towards actual disposable email accounts like Gorilla Mail um, or to one you control. Like I have a Yahoo account that I just use for junk. It doesn't really contain anything important. Um, holders of common name addresses like myself, uh, set up multi-factor authentication. Uh, I think it's pretty reasonable to expect that you, there might be a SIM swap targeting attack on you. Um, lock down your phone with your phone company and tell them that they need additional verification before they change your SIM card around. Um, additional questions, users and businesses, do we accept this risk? I mean, is this where we want our business email going? Uh, or do we want to consider moving to a service uh, where it's a little bit less likely that we're going to have random junk from uh, various people around the world or people trying to attack us? Um, developers, I think, Maybe we need to reconsider using logins that are somebody else's contact detail. That's just a privacy concern um, or part of somebody else's ecosystem. Um, it's hard. Uh, authentication and login is hard, but um, this might be a moment to reconsider um, what we can do there. That is pretty much it. Uh, if you would enjoyed this talk, I have a book out um, that is a book for your relatives who have a really hard time um, with their digital privacy and security or who have hard times with um, their uh, management of disinformation and misinformation. I have some techniques for dealing with that as well, as well as digital mindfulness, um, helping us all survive stress and FOMO and all these other feelings that we get from online. Thank you very much. Uh, see you around at the next OPA. Hi, and welcome back. We're here with Gus Andrews, who just gave an incredible talk about what to do with uh, our, our email issues. And uh, we have one of the questions that we're gonna start out with is, um, how do you deal with illegal content or activity that you might receive in some of these emails? Yeah, um, that's a great one. Um, really just sort of mostly don't engage, uh, delete when possible. Um, uh, I, I think probably if I found something really creepy, like child porn or something, I would probably try to um, report it to the authorities in some way. Um, although it's challenging to figure out how to do that. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, this is sort of a, a fine line to walk. Like I am mostly trying to um, talk about this in order to uh, bring out two things, mostly the, the what people are doing wrong um, and trying to help understand that so it happens less often. And then also just sort of the kismet of like, you know, you're wandering around the internet and random things happen to you, um, which, is, which is always the best part of the internet, which we don't get that much anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really kind of charming in a way, these stories. Like I was saying that we had a back and forth with Patsy and her family. They sent me mail being like, we got in the paper. I'm like, okay, now we're in the paper. Okay, great. <laughs> so. What's my favorite email service? I'm sorry, I am I am seeing comments in the in the chat. What's my favorite email service? Go ahead. Gosh, um, I don't 
really have one. I kind of hate the internet now. Um, Proton Mail is serviceable, I guess. Um, I am unfortunately addicted to Gmail just because it's so easy to search and find things. Um, so, yeah. Sure, sure. You know, one of the questions I had was, um, it seemed like you said you did such an incredible amount of work and it must have taken you years. How long have you spent on this project? You know, actually, I have an answer to that right here because I'm keeping notes um, as I go. I'm keeping sort of a diary of this. I was inspired by Sarah Jane Turp. I've actually only really been doing analysis on this since January, the end of January of this year, it looks like. Um, wow. Yeah, so I, I think that's that's all. Um, but I, I have spent a lot of, it's just fascinating. Like it never gets boring. Like it never, ever, ever gets boring. So. Right. Okay. Our next question is, do you ever get some, someone accusing or thinking you are the person trying to hack them? Um, like I am not uh, calling yeah. the other Andrews, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not totally sure that it, that has happened to me here. When I when I called people and written to them, they've actually been like, oh, I'm surprised. Um, and so if you if you approach them in a gentle kind of a way, I think people are, are a little bit more open to it. Um, but I have yet to reach out to anybody who is really much older and really from a further distance from the internet. Um, so yeah, it's, it hasn't been all that bad. Right, okay. Um, the, uh, let's see, I think, I'm not sure if we've got another question here for you. Uh, you were in the uh, chat, I'm not sure if you found something. Yeah, um, take a look. So I'm seeing a suggestion okay. that don't delete the account tombstone it so someone can't uh, keep attempting to create it and generate a fresh verification email each time. Oh, I don't know about tombstoning it actually. If, I, if you want to post a little bit more information there about how yeah. that works, I would really like to know. Um, All right, I do have a question for you here. So the question is, how long did that auto response take you to craft? craft? Did anyone reply? <laughs> like five seconds. Um, because okay. I've, I've, I've just like <laughs> verbal diarrhea everywhere it took me. No, people have replied. Uh, mostly people have been like, oh, thanks. And that's it. One person wrote, just wrote back, hi. Um, but that was somebody who I think had written on Venmo. There seems to be some sort of Venmo scam of somebody sending like $2 or something like that. And then being like trying to set up a date over it or something like that. Like there's, you know, meet hot girls, whatever. And um, so yeah, they'll, they'll, those, that person was the one who was like, hi, in response to my please go away email. Um, yes, thank you for the hat. I just, I had to give a nod to Bia because she did such a great job incorporating Rainbow Dash on her slides. So I was like, I got to wear my Rainbow Dash hat. It seems like I can't be one up by a, a 13 year old man. She's just, her, her game is much stronger than I am. So it's time, time for some Rainbow Dash. Um, right it is, it's been truly lovely to watch this channel and everybody being like, I feel your pain because really, I think most of us who were early adopters really had this happen. Um, in a lot of ways, so. Exactly, exactly. All right, we're almost out of time here, um, and I don't see any other questions. I, I see one. Uh, what percentage okay. of the Gmails have the instruction at the bottom demanding you delete the email if it's not for you? Um, you obviously, when lawyers send stuff to you, um, and you get a couple. There really aren't that many. Um, there haven't been that many, um, and yeah, I'm not too concerned. That one, the one from the uh, sign twirlers was really amazing. I'm like, why are you bothering with and it was very bespoke. They had handcrafted it for their own understanding of how the their relation to sign twirling and brands works. Um, but yeah, um, so it, just to plug, um, if you enjoyed this talk, if you are worried about people in your life having this kind of trouble with the internet, a book, keep calm and log on. I've got it right here. Let me just hand model myself right here. Um, if you go to keepcomlogon.com, um, that's, uh, you can buy a copy there. Uh, there are now eBooks available. I recommend bookshop.org because that's a way to avoid uh, paying money to Amazon. Um, but yeah, I, there's stuff in here in digital privacy, digital security, basic rules for everyday life for people who might be struggling, but also helping people get around disinformation and misinformation online. Um, and also di digital mindfulness for the rest of us, how to basically unplug and um, stop, you know, in the middle of the night feeling like you need to play whack-a-mole on Twitter with people who are wrong or whatever like that. I've got some tips for that too. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gus Andrews. And uh, on behalf of all the attendees and all the staff here at Hope 2020, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us. It's greatly appreciated. And hopefully we'll see you at the next Hope. Great. Yep. Thanks a lot.